Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock. I'm on the board of the International Humanistic Management Association's USA chapter. I'm also the owner and founder of Humanist Learning Systems. And this is our Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn for February, I don't know what the date is, 19th, uh, 2021. And my co-host is Elizabeth Castillo. Hello, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm out at Arizona State University, and I'm also on the board of the International Humanistic Management, and we really appreciate you being here today. Wonderful. So today, our topic is whistleblowing, and our guest is Wim van der Kerkhove. He earned his PhD in applied ethics from Ghent University in Belgium. He's currently professor of business ethics at the University of Greenwich in London. And he is the co-director of the Center for Research in Employment and Work. He is editor-in-chief of the journal Philosophy of Management. He is, uh, he's published on whistleblowing and he's helped many organizations and policymakers develop practice and policy on whistleblowing, including the Council of Europe, Transparency International, the UK Department of Health, and the International Olympic Committee. He is the convener of the work group that develops the ISO 37. 37002 whistleblowing management systems. I probably said that wrong. An international standard that will be published in April 2021, uh, which is a good thing to know because we had a couple of questions about when it was going to be published. <laughs> um, welcome, Win. Thank you, Jennifer and, and Elizabeth. And it's, uh, uh, thank you for uh, in inviting me uh, to talk about uh, whistleblowing. Um, of course, you know that's a, that's a very broad subject area. So, um, as as I understood, you know, in your in your lunch meetings, uh, it's basically uh, the the speaker presents something just to sort of uh, start the discussion and and start the conversation. And so, um, I did I did prepare something. Um, it's under the title uh, "Why uh, Whistleblowing is Important for Humanistic Management." But I would say, you know, it's actually what I'm what I'm going to be uh, presenting is also, I mean, yeah, why is whistleblowing important for humanistic management, but also vice versa. Um, you know, there is what I, what I'm gonna what I'm gonna say is three things. Uh, if if you if, yeah, if you run an organization or if you you you're into you're looking at, after ethics or compliance in in an organization. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you three tips as to th stuff you can do right now to to make it work better. Um, so th that's sort of the the delineation that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to be talking about internal whistleblowing systems. That's also what the ISO standard uh, is about. It's actually also what I've been mostly interested in in uh, in my research. Is I know there's there's an immense amount of research on whistleblowers. Um, I've actually always had more interest in uh, researching the recipient side. Uh, what about those who receive the reports of whistleblowers? And what's the difficulty in handling uh, a whistle whistleblower report and in handling that that well uh, within organizations? Or you can also look at, at, at it at an institution level. But so what I'm going to be talking about is at an organization level, uh, how can you how can you uh, get better at handling uh, internal whistleblower reports. One thing we can have a conversation about, of course, is okay, what is internal, what is not in, in, uh, internal. Uh, and I'm saying this because uh, one of the things I'm involved with uh, within uh, uh, BSI, that's the British Standards Institute, is they're looking at developing a standard on um, managing. Um, uh, modern slavery risks in supply chains. And of course, you know, if you, you've got a second tier, third tier supplier, is that internal or not? So, you know, there's a whole, um, the, the whole debate to have around what is internal, but I think you, 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 you get the picture, uh, internal whistleblowing, uh, um, and, and where that, you know, what, what that means. It is quite important to, for organizations to get that right. Uh, research in different countries show that people who go outside to regulator or to the press, they nearly have always went inside before that. Okay, and so they go outside because um, you know no one because they they retaliated again, but sometimes also they're not retaliated against, but no one's taking them seriously. 
and so they keep on raising it a second time, a third time, etc. So yeah, there are really um, there are some business case benefits of getting it right, getting internal whistleblowing right. Um, and I think Kyle Welsh uh, in the US um, did some it's very interesting research showing that organization, there was a correlation between organizations who had um, more internal reports, who, who were handling more internal reports, they seem to get lower fines or whenever they need to uh, reach a settlement with a regulator, that settlement uh, amount that appeared to be lower. So, okay, that's, there's your, uh, um, uh, the business case for getting it right. Of course, there's also the softer, maybe more difficult to measure like reputation. But I think, you know, this, it's also, I think there's an, there's an inherent benefit to getting this right. Okay, there's inherently good stuff uh, that happens when you get internal whistleblowing right. Um, when you get it right, you are building a culture. Okay, it's very often that people say, oh, but I need a lot of internal trust for these systems to work. And my point is actually, well, no, if you get it right, this is a way in which you can build a good culture. And that's a culture where people um, uh, see their expertise recognized because very often uh, this is what's going on. I raise a concern because I think, you know, I'm seeing a practice that I, I don't think should be happening. I don't think it's quite right. It might be a gray area, but you know, I've got I've got a position there, um, and so being able to take that seriously and deal with it um, in an appropriate way is a recognition of the expertise of the person who's who's raising a concern, who's who's reporting an alleged wrongdoing. I also think that if if you got an internal whistleblowing system, when people use that, there is always a lack of trust. Otherwise, they would raise it directly with the wrongdoer, or they would raise it directly with the line manager. And and, and the research we've done is that you know, when people first raise it, uh, it is with their line manager. Now, at that time, they don't identify themselves as a whistleblower, not at all. But it's yeah, you know, if the line manager doesn't listen, or oh, they need they need to go higher up, or they need to go to a specialist channel. Uh, like you know the the whistleblowing channel in an organization. So you know, sort of you know, the 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 theory would say you know whenever someone uses a whistleblowing channel in an organization, there is a lack of trust. There is a lack of trust between the person who reports and uh, the line manager or or the or the wrongdoer. Okay, that trust is broken, but there still is trust in the organization. Right? These people still think that the organization will can have a look at this. Um, and so it's it that's really the chance of the organization to keep that trust. Okay, so trust is a, works at at uh, at different levels. There's a lack of individual trust, but there still is trust in the organization. So if you mess that up, then yes, you know, a lot of uh, some people would, would would shut up, but other people uh, then go outside, um, and then the things sometimes uh, escalate. Now, so. What I'm talking, what I'm sort of the imagined audience. I don't, I don't know who, who the audience was going to be, but um, actually, the ideal audience for what I'm going to say is would be people who uh, run these systems in an organization and who want to get it right. Um, I've done if when I when whenever I I I let's say you know if I look at a cohort of 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 managers, sometimes compliance managers, sometimes HR, sometimes medical directors, um, but who sort of operate or oversee this, I think, you know, the small minority, uh, when I was talking to them, I thought like, man, you know, I would never want to work in this organization. Um, another small minority are pockets of amazing practice. It's really, you know, really, truly impressive. And I think that that's where I get my, my cues from. But I think the over you know, the, the 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 biggest chunk in the middle is sort of they say like yeah we think it could be better, but they don't really know how. And one of the myths uh, uh, is that oh we need more people to report, um, and that's not true. Okay, if you got let's say you got two hundred employees, why would you need all two hundred of them to report a wrongdoing for for you to be able to do something about it? Okay, so the question, how many people do you actually need to report? Not even half, 
okay? Uh, it, it might be okay, it might be really enough if only five of those 200 actually do report. You know, the question is, when someone does report something, what do you do with it? Um, and here's, here's a, a, an anecdote, and this is something that, that happened recently. So I was talking to a, um, someone from internal audit and uh, it's really keen, you know, really keen on getting internal whistleblowing uh, right. Um, but he said, look, you know, we've got 30,000 employees. Um, and last year, um, you know, I had, I had 16 reports. And, you know, out of those 16, you know, we, we could only investigate 11, only you know, in 11 cases, enough information to actually investigate. Um, and we found something in eight cases. I say, yeah, that, that's great. That, that's really good. And he said, no, it's not. Said, well, what's wrong? He said, 30,000 people and only 16 people report. It can't be, you know, th there must be much more going on, going wrong. I said, okay, so you want more reports? Yeah. I said, what, what if next year you would have 32? Would that be enough? He said, well, 32, I'm not sure. Why not? Well, you know, we don't have the resources to investigate. Well, then, you know, what do you want? You want more people to report, but you're not, you can't investigate. So you, you also need to, you need to make sure that when people do report, you are able to, to respond. So just, just wanting more reports is sometimes, you know, you're, you're setting up the, you're setting yourself up to fail. You're setting yourself up to, to disappoint people to, to, to have neglect. So I think, you know, we really need to, look further than just more reports. It's really about the reports you get, try to do more with them. And, uh, and are you sure you're, you're, you're doing enough with them? Now, uh, I am gonna show, share a slide and uh, Jennifer, I'm, I'm, you said 15 minutes and I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna run over. So um, sorry about that, but- um, Not a problem, that's fine. I, I, am, I, am gonna, I am gonna hurry. So, you know, how do you get it right? It's not just more reports, you need to handle them better. Okay, so how do you handle them better? Well, the, I think the three things you can do, you can immediately do is, you know, one, go and look at what does your triage process look like when reports come in and you're gonna say, okay, uh, what are we gonna investigate? What are we not gonna investigate? You know, what do we do with the stuff that comes in? What does that look like? You know, that's, that's a place that you can actually uh, hugely increase uh, efficiency. And when I say efficiency, it's, it's, I'm talking in terms of maintaining trust, okay? Remember, the individual trust is broken, but people still trust the organization. That's why they do internal, and that's why they use the, the whistleblowing hotline or channel, whatever. Okay? You want to maintain that trust. It's, don't take it for granted that that is easy. Right? It's, it's not because when you investigate, it's gonna take a while. And once you've ended the investigation, you won't be able to share all the, all the details of the uh, investigation, right? So people will need to trust you that you've actually looked into this, okay? And sometimes you don't find anything. So the whole thing is also, if you didn't find anything, you really want the person who reported to believe you. Right? Otherwise, yeah, they go outside, okay, but you know, they can, cause a lot of noise and that's not necessary, okay? So that it's a triage case, then it's proactive protection and then also uh, giving feedback, okay? So let's first say um, the, the triage. Um, you can imagine that uh, the stuff, you know, the people making reports, there's all kinds of stuff that, that comes in, okay? Even if you're specific, say, I only wanna hear about financial fraud, people are gonna report all kinds of stuff, okay? And be, be, you need to be ready for that. Now, the research and the research, it's gonna be in, uh, I, I think Jennifer, you, you'll be able to say, share these slides, right? So on the third slide, there's a, one of the resources is to a website from a uh, project in Australia uh, called Whistling While They Work. And it's, a, it's got a huge, uh, a huge, bunch, huge survey, both for people who reported wrongdoing and people who are handling uh, uh, reports. Now it shows that uh, on average, from what comes in, 20% is really purely a public interest type of wrongdoing. This is clearly an integrity issue. Um, financial fraud would be one. And then 34% is really, yeah, it's the personal grievance. Okay, it's a per workplace grievance. 
uh, but 46%, so nearly half, is mixed. Okay, there's a, there is an integrity element, but also some personal grievance or a history of uh, grievances there be, be, between the people. Now, that research shows that it's the mixed reports that are most likely to go wrong in handling it. Um, and one of the reasons uh, we think is that those mixed reports are too easily swiped away as a grievance. And they're also dealt with as a grievance. So HR would say, okay, this is a grievance. Okay, we need to mediate here. It's a workplace conflict. So, you know, the, the whole idea is uh, try, to get, try to get people to uh, uh, shake hands and say, okay, how do we continue? How do we work again tomorrow together? Okay, that, that's sort of the ideal solution. Whereas if there's an integrity issue and people use your whistleblowing channel, um, perhaps you know, the mediation isn't, isn't immediately what needs to happen. Okay? The way you're going to investigate this, the way you're going to keep confidentiality is you're not going to tell the wrongdoer that it was Jane uh, uh, who, who, blew, who blew the whistle on them. And that's why you're investigating. Okay? You're not going to do that. Uh, and so I, we think that those mixed reports too easily get into uh, uh, simply, you know, oh, that's a grievance. It's, it's, not, it's not for us. Um, if you look at the, the sort of um, trust people have in investigations, um, it's when it's a stuff they report or as uh, you know, public interest, like financial fraud or purely integrity stuff, people are, are most happy about how that is reported. And most happy, I mean, both reporters as well as people who handle those reports. They would say, okay, yeah, those, those reports are, are really well investigated. And actually the outcome for, for the reporter are, are, is also best in those cases. Um, it's really the ones that are mixed up that, that don't really get a, a very good um, dealing in terms of how they are uh, investigated. Uh, so it's a wrong type of investigation. The confidentiality of the reporter is too easily breached. And it's just you know, sweeping the matter under under the carpet as, as a whole grievance, right? And the integrity issue get, is, is forgotten, okay? And so that's not, a, that's not a good way. So when you look at your triage, you really need to say, okay, the person who's doing this, are they aware that they might have certain biases in how, they're gonna, how they are gonna do the triage? Definitely a rule, rule zero, I would say, is don't bin any reports. Always, always try to have, okay, uh, uh, what do we do with a report? It might be that it, that there's just not enough information there. Just don't bin it. Keep it. Keep it somewhere. You know, keep keep some indication of it, because you know maybe in two months' time there's going to be another report from the same area in your organization saying exactly the same thing. Like, mm, that's a weird one. Okay, uh, it, it, one, it, uh, one example I've recently heard is, is about someone saying there's rats in the basement. Uh, really, you know, they called in specialists to find rats. There were no rats. Um, but rats in the basement was like a sign to say like yeah, people are stealing here. Okay, um, so why can't they be more clear? Indeed, why can't they be more clear? But, you know, sometimes they're not. Sometimes it, people do, um, it's an indication of how much they trust you, uh, uh, perhaps. You know, they, they want to raise a concern, but they don't want to be the ones who, who did it, who raised it. So they're sort of trying to be very, very, uh, very um, careful. So, you know, even, even the, the ones that you think, are, oh, you know, what, they're wasting your time. They might be, they might not be, okay? Don't bin any, keep them. Then, you know, between compliance and HR, uh, make sure there is a good liaison. Uh, so make sure there is someone in HR. If, if compliance does the triage, then, you know, there needs to be someone in the HR, a specific liaison that's aware of keeping confidentiality so that when, they, when, they th when you think it's a HR issue um, and that person starts to sort of look into it, it might be that, well, it's not just a HR issue. There actually is a compliance issue. So it should go back to, to compliance. So make sure that that alliance is there. Um, if, if, I, if I think of um, conversations I had 
I'd say even, you know, even 15 years ago, even 10 years ago with, with compliance officers, you know, this, this was hard to say, because this was you know, that the kind of stuff that I'm saying now it was very, very difficult to, to say them because every time you talk about internal whistleblowing, it's sort of, oh yeah, and people abuse it and this and that, and I think, oh gosh, you know, uh, <laughs> why, why always 1000 reasons why this, this, this doesn't work. But actually, it's in compliance that I've really seen a, a, a huge change. But what compliance, when I talk to compliance officers, what they tell me now is that, you know, their HR departments just don't get it, right? Or it, 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 their CEO or even people on the board, they don't really under, they don't really get it. Okay, so I think you know, that we've really seen a shift in, in, in compliance officers and really understanding, you know, this could be, this could be, it's the golden dust for your, for your organization. It could save, it could really save, save a lot and it's culture building, but everyone needs to get it in the organization. Um, and then of course, you know, um, looking at your triage, make sure you, you don't have a tendency to sweep all the tricky stuff as grievance and saying, oh, this isn't the proper motivation here, uh, right? Or that person took very long for them to report. They've been thinking about this for three months. Hmm. Well, this is quite normal actually for someone to think about, is what I'm seeing wrong or is it not? Okay, is this a breach of policy or is it not? It's just decent enough or not, you know? People, people doubt. Uh, uh, sometimes, so uh, you need to be aware of that. So your 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 triage, have a look at that again uh, to to make sure that you know. Look at those mixed reports. What do you tend to do with them? And think about that again. Then, secondly, uh, proactive protection. Um, the, the, there are always a lot of questions around protections and and how should organizations protect their whistleblowers? What what can they do? Um, and, and the key idea here is, is also a, is, a, is an Australian one and, and it's one that I've seen uh, actually best, uh, best developed by the former New South Wales uh, ombudsman. Um, and it's actually found its way into an uh, ASIC, which is the financial uh, regulator in Australia. They have a regulatory guidance 270. I think I've also put the link there. Uh, regulatory guidance 270 uh, from November 2019, and this, this actually has uh, uh, guidance on uh, uh, proactive uh, uh, um, protection. The key thing is there, you do a risk assessment as soon as a report is made. So you don't wait, you don't start thinking about protection when the whistleblower says, and now I'm being retaliated against. It's, you know, when that happens, it's very difficult to get that right. So you want to be ahead of the game, right? So you make a risk assessment in terms of how likely is it that this, this reporter will face detriment. Um, in, the, in the Whistling While They Work research, the organizations who did that had actually a 34% more success rate in terms of, you know, making sure that, you know, um, the... Um, the outcome for the reporter wasn't uh, wasn't de detrimental, um, and actually, me saying that if, if you talk to managers, um, it's a, it should be common sense. It's not, but it should be. Just think about this. Every time you do project management, right? We we teach. You know, if if you if you uh, if you've been to a business school, this is what they taught you. If you do a project, you identify the risks and you think ahead in terms of how can you mitigate the risks that, that you might meet, okay? It's the same kind of fundamental logic when it comes to handling a whistleblower report. Uh, as soon as a report is made, what are the risks of this going wrong? Also in terms of, of protection. Um, and um, so, you know, it's, it's a basic idea but not many, not many people do it. Now, the sort of questions um, you go, uh, you, you can ask are around, you know, what is the risk of the identity of the reporter becoming known? How big is the team? Is this person the only one who, who knows about the wrongdoing? Uh, who have they spoken before? You know, those, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, who do they fear might cause a detriment? Yeah. Maybe it's not obvious to you, but it might be obvious to them. Um, are, are there existing problems 
uh, workplace conflicts that might be lingering um, you know, previously or not, because sometimes retaliation is very subtly leveraged through that and have there already been threats. So it's that, that kind of stuff. Um, I think, you know, think about that and, and I think you'll, you'll do a lot better. And then uh, the third element is uh, around maintaining trust throughout the process. So they come to you, they trust you. Okay, you, you need to keep that trust and you actually need to work uh, um, uh, at it. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes, and I'm being stereotypical here, um, and, and uh, it's a caricature in a negative sense, but okay, uh, the, the, the stereotype sort of Dilbert cartoon type of uh, uh, mindset of a compliance officer is when someone makes a report is, yeah, you know, there's an automatic email sent to acknowledge, uh, yeah, uh, uh, well received. Uh, and then four months later, when you close the investigation, you just send the standard email saying, oh yeah, thank you uh, for raising your concern. The case is now closed, full stop, okay? And hey, you've given them feedback twice. You've given feedback, right? Okay. Now imagine you're the person who reported that. Uh, you've reported your team manager because they're, they're faking, uh, faking expenses. Okay. When you report, what is your expectation? Now, think about that. Uh, and then the, the four months of silence, what have you been thinking and how has your thinking changed? And when you get the email saying, thank you, the case is now closed, what do you actually think happened? Okay. Right? It's a very different, uh, so the compliance officer say, oh, I've given feedback twice. Okay, for the person reporting it, no, no, that's not what happened. Okay, there's something seriously wrong here in with this organization. Okay, that you're convinced of that. Okay, so you know all hell breaks loose, or you decide to leave and yeah, you know, take a job elsewhere. Right? Um, but the thing is, this organization had trust when someone reported it, and they've lost trust uh, along the way. This is very tricky, and this is what people who handle uh, uh, reports uh, uh, tell us. Uh, they're saying, you know, it is it is tricky because at, at certain points, you know that what you're going to tell them, they don't want to hear it. They want to hear, um, yes, you're right, you know, that, that wrongdoer, and they want to see the wrongdoer leave, okay? But sometimes you don't find any wrongdoing. They've been looking at the wrong screen or, you know, it just, there's just nothing there. And sometimes even when, when you did find wrongdoing, it doesn't mean you're gonna, you, you sack the wrongdoer, okay? Maybe the wrongdoing wasn't up to that level. Maybe it's a disciplinary warning, okay? Um, so, you know, it, you, really need, you really need that trust uh, when you close the investigation that the person is gonna do it. Um, and, hey, and, uh, real quick, yeah. we're at about 30 minutes. So if we can wrap it up and move on to questions, that would yeah. be great. Okay, so wrapping it up, and this is, this is where the uh, ISO 37002 gives a lot of uh, guidance on uh, the sort of feedback. Uh, uh, you can give. It's really managing expectations, okay? What's the current step? What's the next step? What the expected time frame? What sort of routes could th this take? Really try to establish rapport in saying, you know, do you want to keep this channel for communication? Do you want another one? You know, that kind of give info on available advice, give info on responsibility of the organization, give info on what the whistleblower, what the reporter should do to, to maintain their confidentiality themselves. Okay, I'm gonna stop here. I apologize, Jennifer, for running over. Not a problem. It was very, very interesting. Um, it, I like this idea of being proactive. You know, I come from a behavioral perspective and, you know, if, if there is an issue going on and someone tries to get it to stop, behaviorally, we expect the behavior to escalate, like the bad, it, say bullying is happening, you would expect the bullying to get worse if it's reported. And so the idea that you take the, you do a risk assessment and you plan for it, how are you going to protect this person as soon as the report is done, instead of going, oh, wow, there was retaliation. Don't they know retaliation is illegal? <laughs> you know? um, no, but plan for it. I, I really like that part. And it's going to be interesting to see, too, your guidelines on, I think, the, the place when I talk to people, the expectations on what they can communicate 
and what they can't communicate during an investigation, I think is one of the reasons why it just feels like it's a black hole. People report and four months later, something is kicked out and they have no idea what goes on. So having some clarity on what can be communicated, I think would be helpful. So can you give us a little hint or did you already do that? And what do you, what do you mean? What, what can be communicated when? When uh, with the risk assessment or in the feedback? In the feedback to the whistleblower. Yeah. I think you also need to need to actually prepare the whistleblower that at the end of the investigation, it's likely that you, know, you probably won't be able to share all the details. And there's very good reasons uh, why you can't share uh, all the details or many details of the investigation. Right? And you can explain that. Um, and I think, you know, the um, one, one caveat here is that, of course, if the whistleblower is anonymous, this is very hard to do, okay? Um, and, and I got this from someone who does investigations in the context of sports integrity. Um, and, and, and he used the wording, which I thought was, was really spot on. He said, you know, you need to really try and work with the whistleblower. Don't, don't just think if you're going to do the investigation and say, like, take the report and then shut the whistleblower out and, uh, and so you say, oh, okay, it's tricky because you need to do the investigation impartially. But nevertheless, you know, you really need to find your way to, to work with the whistleblower. That's why um, I think, I think, you know, with what we're going to see, um, uh, what we're going to see in, in, in Europe uh, with the EU directive, and I think a lot more organizations who currently don't have policies and systems will have these, uh, they'll have these, um, as a sort of, you know, it's a it's an online uh, reporting channel. Um, the the cool thing about this is you can actually have two way anonymous communication, right? But 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 you're so you, so it's a, it, it it looks like I mean I'm sure many of you have already seen this. So it looks a bit like 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 a chat uh, uh, thing you you can have. I understand that in the U.S. still you know the the hotline and actually people calling is still the most popular one that never really really took off in 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 europe um so i think and and i think you know with with the hotline you need to yeah how how do you call them back you know with that two-way anonymous online online thing you can actually type something back the question is will they go on the system again to look okay but you know it is i think it is easier to to get a a an ongoing uh, communication and if you build trust well then people might be comfortable to uh, um, to reveal their identity if they're they're aware of the confidentiality I think you know I think you with anonymity I think a lot of people overestimate their an anonymity they think it's an anonymous hotline I'm going to be anonymous um, but it, it, it depends you know if you're going to start an investigation it's very, it, it can be that, you know, that it's very easy. Oh, we're all of a sudden we're investigated. Where wow. it's not difficult because last week it was Jennifer. Jennifer, you, you, you ran out. You were furious last week, right? Mm, it must be Jennifer. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's Jennifer. Okay. Um, so it's the obvious thing, but, but sometimes people, yeah, they don't, you know, sometimes people don't, uh, don't realize that. Um, uh, so I think I think that's a, that is an important one. The other thing is, if it is unlikely that you'll be able to investigate without the identity of uh, uh, the reporter, uh, that that's as, it's obvious who it is. Then you know you also need to need to prepare for that, and maybe maybe it's possible to uh, to move the worker to another department. And I say maybe. You know, sometimes people see that as a form of retaliation, the fact that they're moved to a different department, but sometimes sometimes not. So I think, you know, that it's, it's an, if, if, you know, managing that risk is then, it depend, really depends on the situation. Um, and also um, you, need, you need to do that together with the, with the reporting person. Sure. Elizabeth, I, I assume we have questions in the chat room, so. Um, we do, and I'll start with a Mar Marty Schumacher who um, wants to know what countries have the best whistleblower protection laws and record of litigating corporate and government corruption. Mm. 
I, I, I would say, you know, when I would say that that is the US. You know, there's the, yeah. I think, you know, that that is, that's definitely the impression. I think if you, if you ask worldwide, that that is going to be, that is definitely the, the perception. Um, I think, you know, a country that we, uh, not a lot of us have on our radar, uh, but that I think is actually, is actually really interesting is South Korea. Uh, in terms of you, they also have, um, I mean, I work in the UK and uh, the, the whole issue about uh, rewards for whistleblowers, my God, it's such a sensitive, um, it's very hard to have the discussion because it's, you, you people are, can't be rational about it. Um, uh, and they say, oh yeah, you know, but it's not, uh, it's, it's a, not in our culture, actually it is, you know, Kitom, Kitom legislation has been for centuries in, in England, but, but anyways, but so actually uh, the example of South Korea, because the South Korean uh, and, uh, um, anti-corruption agency also has a, a reward program. And so, you know, it's a US individualistic culture, South Korea, you know, it's a, a collective culture, but they have, they have rewards. So it's always the example I use to, try and um, the the you know if the discussion is difficult it's also I, I think the interesting thing there is they have rewards for uh, financial uh, wrongdoing uh, but they also have rewards for um, wrongdoing where it's it's a bit more difficult to calculate so you know you can't say okay you get 30 percent from whatever the government is able to to recover um, fine you know um, but let's say, uh, uh, you, know, you know, what's the cost of a life? How do you calculate that? Or, um, you know, environmental damage beyond the cost of cleaning it up? You know, how, how do you calculate that? And so, you know, that they also have that in South Korea. So I, I would say, you know, South Korea would 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 be the interesting one. Which one? I, I don't do rankings. I, it's very hard to do. I think the international. This is something. If if you're interested in that, watch out for this. The International Bar Association has done, I think, a 30 country comparison on um, uh, uh, cases, court cases, uh, of of whistleblowing legislation, and, and a comparison uh, uh, between that. They've been mulling this over and over, and one of the reasons is that it is so hard to compare. Country, yeah, one country to to another country, but I think it's it's really down to regulators and how 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 serious are regulators with um, using whistleblower information, and uh, and what what is their mandate, um, and I think in that respect, uh, you know, the SEC is uh, is 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 yeah quite uh, quite impressive. And I think you know the South, the South African uh, agency also. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Volker had a question. Um, how do you encourage a whistleblowing culture without promoting a de a practices of denunciation? An interesting example I've seen is is from a from an engineering uh, uh, company, and what they did was when they um, when they started this whole thing. They had they had a reporting channel, um, and they also had a question channel. Um, and they said, you know, they said like we've we've seen this, and they 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 have it now for, I think more more about fifteen years, something like that. Um, and they said, look, you know, when they started, um, a lot we saw a lot of a lot of questions in the uh, going to the question channel not so much the reporting channel, okay? So, but people were testing and saying, well, it's not for me. <laughs> You're sort of not for me, for my friend, you know? <laughs> I need to ask, is this okay or not? Um, and I said, gradually, you know, and there's no allegations there, okay? It's not like I've seen so-and-so, that came through the reporting channel, but you see like people were testing, you know? And they said like, those were, those were things that were quite easy for us to respond to. Okay. And so we could be a responsive organization. Those were signals. And gradually you saw the question channels going down. They just called up the compliance officer and said, hey, you know, I've got a question around this, if they really had a question. And so the reporting channel sort of went, went up. Um, and I've also seen this in a, in a hospital. Um, and, 
and so the question channel is the very operational stuff. Um, so the example was um, someone saying, well, the radio is playing in the operation theater. Is, is that okay? Or is that, is that, could that be dangerous? What's the position here? Okay. So this is not so-and-so, this is not about wrongdoing. This is about the gray area. And so those, those are very easy, easy ways in which you can be responsive in which you can actually, to those questions that are not, you know, no allegations, you can communicate that back to the whole of the organization. Um, and, and what you create is that people who are interested in integrity stuff, in you know, the gray area and what's the advice and how do we deal with that? And I think that's those, with those kind of signals that, uh, that can help. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm now gonna combine two questions. And the, if, First part comes from Jules, who wants to know, um, would it be an idea to outsource whistleblowing nationally, like an ombudsman? And then Alexander had weighed in and said, in Europe, um, they have a national ombudsman as a common practice for state agencies, um, but for corporations, it might be hard because of intellectual property. So can you weigh on, in on that conversation? Yeah, I think, you know, that's a fascinating, uh, that's a fascinating one. Um, I think you know one of the one of the problems in the UK, for example, is that there is one one legislation that covers all sectors, public, private, even you know, non 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 covers everything. But the regulators is it's very dispersed, right? Um, so it's very decentralized, and there's there's a kind of need of some central agency that could at least. Uh, set a standard for these different regulators on how they need to deal with with whistleblowers uh, that that come to them. So in, in a sense, I am I am someone who who does see some promise in you know at least having some kind of central agency uh, uh, to to deal or, or to set standards for 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 other bodies who, who might investigate. I think we're going to see that in Europe. Uh, we don't we. No, there's not that much. So it's saying in Europe, they have, well, I'm not sure. Yes, they do have national ombudsman, but that's correct. You know, it's for, it's for like civil service or they deal with issues. Uh, citizens uh, has, a, has an issue with a government agency you know, and, and a, there's a conflict there. Uh, it's not, not, not necessarily a workplace whistleblowing. The, the funny thing is, so the Netherlands has a whist dedicated whistleblowing agency. They want it to put that under the national ombudsman, uh, but the Council of State said, no, it's not constitutional because um, national ombudsman has no say over private corporations. Um, that wasn't the problem in France. In France, they also, it is the national ombudsman who's taken up uh, the same role as, as the Netherlands does. So, you know, I think uh, with the transposition of the EU directive, we're going to see some uh, some uh, things are going to move around in the 27 member states uh, of the European Union, and we're going to see some variety there. So it's uh, yeah, uh, we're going to see a, a lot of trial and error. I, I'm, I'm I'm afraid, but but yeah. Um, well, I'm going to throw in one of my questions um, before I go to the others, um, and that is, what is the relationship between uh, whistleblowing and um, the reporting to external stakeholders, say like shareholders? I had seen a really interesting integrated report by Jones, Lang, and LaSalle, where they shared the number of ethics violations that had been reported, the ones that got investigated, and how many were found to be. And that really gave me a lot of respect for that company. Do you see that as a trend, especially in light of all the ESG movement? Well, thanks, Elizabeth. You see, I, I have the same reaction li like you do. I think this is, th this gives me trust. Okay. It's like, okay, you've got a process there. You, I, you're, you're handling, you're handling cases. Great. Okay. Um, apparently, uh, this isn't, um, not everyone <laughs> reacts like that. Um, and so I, I don't know what what company you, you saw that you saw this from, but I know from a company who who also does that, and uh, yeah, there it is a continuing discussion within the organization whether that is now a clever thing to do or not. So not everyone, and some people say like just don't do it because the outside world doesn't get it, uh, and, and that that is that is the other worry. Um, as organ, I know that this. I think this is like a first mover ph phenomenon, 
probably you know the outside world doesn't necessarily understand how to read it because oh last year you had you had 100 reports and uh you know you you you've investigated 20 and you've closed 30 what happened to the other 50 you swept them under the carpet well no they're still ongoing hey you know and, and so you know it, it's that kind of yeah you need to and apparently it is also sometimes uh, uh journalists who are not not immediately aware uh, as to how how they should read this so i think you know i think we need we need to develop a bit more maturity around that but 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 that is coming i think that's the you know from not, not immediately but but i think you know maybe 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 in 10 years time i do expect that that will be that will be standard to do but we need to also figure out what are the right metrics to to it's like you know a uh, gri uh, would would be good if to, if if they would have something you know global reporting initiative if they would say well if you do report your whistleblowing metrics report these indicators and report them like that 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 well, would uh, help would, would the new iso standards that are coming out in april point the way towards that core kind of shared understanding no we, we don't it doesn't give guidance on what metrics to report it does give guidance on because it's really important that when you have an internal whistleblowing system that you do measure um and and you do review you need to evaluate your system because frankly yeah i mean as I said, you know, I've, I've seen I've seen organizations that their internal system, I thought it's damn, you know, it's really good, it's really impressive. Um, but for a lot of for a lot of organizations, they're really hesitating uh, about this. And the advice would be start with some with a scope that's comfortable. But as you go, you'll see that you can do this. And and then the tendency is and to, for organizations to become confident and broaden the scope and and you know uh, uh, just just get better at doing it. But they need to evaluate. So there are indicators on how to evaluate whether you you're gonna publish that. I think you need to you need also need to understand who who is your audience gonna be. Um, yeah, and are they do that? Will they know how to how to understand it? rather than if you report something and nine out of 10 times it's misunderstood, you know, you, maybe it's not the right time yet to actually report that externally. That's the um, idea. I would like to ask a follow-up on that. Um, and that is that in a couple of instances that I've been involved in, you know, we, we start tracking things um, and then pe the trust develops and then people start using the system. So our numbers of reported problems actually goes up which is actually an indication that people are trusting us to help solve the problems. Um, but other people look at it and think, oh my goodness, we have all these problems, this is horrible. Yeah. Um, and so how do you help companies and organizations overcome the, let's shut it all down, we had, this is horrible um, yeah. response to the- Yeah, you see, yeah. So, this is fascinating, you know, so you also see that, that numbers game, you know? And it's like, yeah, you know, and this is very often, you know, the, the compliance people, and then you know, say, oh, you have a meeting with the board, and the board says, how many reports you have? And they say, well, you know, last month, five. Oh, is that enough? Who knows? Who knows whether it's enough? So you know, the numbers, the numbers say, I mean, the, the main, the big advice is don't try to compare with, with other organizations, uh, and especially if they're not in your same, you know, geographical zone or it's definitely the same industry or maybe if they don't have the same history or, or, or whatever it's, it's not a good idea to compare with other organizations compare with yourself compare with what you had last year and what could explain it if there's more or less you know one thing you see is also that uh, if you give ethics training immediately after that it, it, it goes up okay uh, if it doesn't go up well, maybe you need to look at your ethics training. Maybe it wasn't interesting enough. Okay, uh, so you know, there's all kinds of stuff you can learn from that. But I think it's also um, what's your substantiation rate. So as I said, you know, it's like with the complex cases, with how many did you find really difficult to triage well? Yeah, you know, look at the ones that you, know, you messed up on. Okay, what what sort of what sort of characteristics did they have? Do they have? Did, do they have something in common? Okay, so that, there's that's that's where you learn from. 
really that that's how you improve your 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 response system um yeah i think you know com compare with yourself and and don't just look at the amount also try to look at what do you do with that is your, the example of the company that had the question line and the reporting line right to to see how that how that changes uh, and a real indicator of trust would be uh, they actually stop using the reporting line to report they actually come and talk to you to say what's wrong okay but you know how are you going to document that it's i think you know it's, these systems are actually also a in a sense, they are, they're a, a, a protection for the company as well, for the organization, that you'll be able, if you've done, uh, use the word due diligence, if you've done what can be reasonably expected from you, then, you know, you've, you've, you've done what can be reasonably expected from you, okay? You're, who, who, can, who can want more? Um, it's, it is, you know, nothing, nothing is going to be 100% um, successful in this uh, in this area there are um, going to be we have about 10 minutes left and so if anybody wants one of the certificates of completion put please put your name and your email and which certificates you want in the chat room we have an hrci a sherm and a general certificate of completion elizabeth um, yes, thank you, Jenna. I was going to say that. And then, uh, Wim, thank you for, for those answers. I mean, I think really what I'm hearing then is it's a matter of is the company willing and able to hold itself accountable or is it only going to do it if it's pushed and forced to? Um, and then that speaks to two types of culture. And, and Ken asked a question about how do you think about the, an organizational culture that's like killing the messenger? And we also had a question that had come in in the registration from Pardeep, who wanted to know, you know, he said in India, you would you would be fired if you did a whistleblower complaint. So can you speak to those kind of issues? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the. It's it's for most of all, most organizations, I would say, you know, that there's, there's not um, they're not they're not monoliths. Right. There are people who inside organizations who want to get this right. And there's people who think like, it's just a bunch of crap and just get on with it. You know, that kind of, it's very different attitude. So you are going to have your your very most common would be to have those tensions in an organization. This is where I see, you know, hopefully that, you know, legislation can actually uh, uh, give the people who want to do it, who want to get this right, you know, sort of the, the, the advantage because it allows them to start arguing the business case, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think, you know, if you're in an organization where you know, all of the leadership really wants to shoot the messenger, um, you know, you as a compliant, as, as the only one, even though the person who's gonna report, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's gonna be very hard, uh, but, uh, you know, we see people who who do it. Nevertheless, you know, despite everything, they do it, and that that's um, yeah. I've always been impressed with with that. I've hardly ever done research on whistleblowers, but uh, you know, I talk I talk a lot to whistleblowers, and and I'm I'm very very impressed with the perseverance and the and 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 the courage that that they have. Um, so, but of course, it's going to be it's going to be very hard. One of the things um, that I hear compliance um, officers say is that uh, one of the pressures they feel is um, around confidentiality of the whistleblower. Okay, in the UK, we had a famous case <laughs> of someone uh, trying twice, a CEO have, doing two attempts on finding out who the whistleblower was and the compliance officer say, no, I'm not saying. Compliance officer went to the board and said like, Hey, do you know what's going on? And the board said, "Okay, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna report our CEO to the regulator." Um, and so it's amazing, isn't it? Um, but you know, we we would want to see. Uh, I think we I, I'd want to see more of that because apparently, I've heard compliance officers say like that is not a, a rare case. It is very common. You come to the board and said, "Look, we've got a report that you know, this is going wrong." So who said it? it's not relevant you know but the pressure to who said it to yeah, that 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 is real so i think you know you've got you've got the really tiny minority who 
really knows what they're doing and they want to shoot the messenger. But I think the big bulk is they've got a blind spot and it's very human tendency of someone said, oh, who was it? But, you know, not to pressure the system, let the, you know, make sure you've got a good system, give it good support and let it do what it does. Um, I, and I think the key is to convince boards and, uh, and, and see, uh, see level manager management of that, you know, that you really need to support your compliance or whoever overseas runs the system um, so that it, it can run impartially. Um, thank you. I, I think we'll um, close with a question, two related questions. One from Marty about um, the major problem in researching this is the different definitions of what a violation is and how tight or loose that definition is. Um, and it's similar to the corruption research issues. Um, and uh, then um, Susana, who's a PhD student, wanted to know about the research opportunities, like what are the ripe areas for research in this area? Wow. Um... Okay, so stuff that that's really not well researched is um, the gender dimension in whistleblowing. Yeah. In the way that whist whistleblowers are responded to, and 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 you know, whether it's with the employer, whether it's when they go to court, you know, what sort of what sort of stereotyping uh, uh, stuff do you do you get there? Um, there's a lot of indications that it is a very it is a gendered experience, and not just uh, the the type of wrongdoing you report, um, but yeah. Um, so so there, there's a lot of cues that it is a gendered issue, but there's, at the moment there's no no research uh, about it. The only thing that 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 seems to uh, uh, come out is that um, women are more are less likely to report. Uh, and what, when they report, they are more likely to suffer retaliation than men. Um, okay, you know, um, but as I said, you know, apart from that, you know, we there's, there there's really is is a bit more need uh, around that. And then, yeah, definitely the um, you're seeing a lot of regime change uh, around the world, so different you know legislation and policies and. And, and I'm really interested at the moment in the, in the, the institutional landscape around whistleblowing, like, you know, uh, which countries are going to have uh, 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 what sort of agencies uh, look at this. Um, and a lot of countries in Europe is they're they're just starting that institutionalization phase. And so that's really fascinating to to see how, how that is going to evolve. Um, okay, Jen, do you have any more questions? No, I think this was really, really interesting and helpful. I wish we had another three hours <laughs> to talk with you about this, um, but we will make sure everybody, uh, there's going to be a video and we'll put up a link to the materials you gave us. Um, so when people have more questions, uh, hopefully they can get in contact with you and, and know where yeah. to ask okay. them. Um, this has been the International Humanistic Management Association's uh, Humanistic Professionals Lunch and Learn program. Um, we have another one scheduled in April at this point. We are still looking for someone for March. There may or may not be a March one. We don't know yet, but there's definitely one in April. If you want to know what IMA has going on, you go to our website, and that's above, humanisticmanagement.international. Um, and look on our events tab and you'll see our upcoming events. I know we have a community connect. We have um, the PhD network. Um, and so there's other things that are going on. Um, I know there's some necessary conversations going to be coming up as well. And I wanna thank you for joining us. Elizabeth, any last words? Um, no, just thank you so much everybody for coming today. And Wynn, thank you so much for a great talk. It was very encouraging and inspiring. And, and thank you, Wim, for joining us Thanks today. It was really helpful. Thank you. Thank you.